Deviant uh, was on stage at DEF CON on a Sunday, and we charged the stage, all the goons did, carrying foam swords, and we, we literally like swarmed the stage and had a mock sword fight battle on a you know, Sunday morning. And we did it 15 minutes into his uh, talk so that it is actually in the video for the con, so. Nice. Yeah. All right, you ready? If we hit the signal button? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Well, we're up here rambling, so. Uh, well, presentation today is on video tales and fails, recording your conference and getting it out to the community. Um, I'm Iron Geek. I run irongeek.com. Hopefully some of y'all visit the site. I have an interest in InfoSec education. I don't know everything. Mr. Geek with time on my hands. If I get something wrong, let me know. I'm also a senior information security engineer at Fortune 1000 company and co-founder of DerbyCon, and I go and record a lot of conferences. And apparently, I'm not the guy who put all the presentation together because no hat fly, no hat flies in from the top and goes on my stud muffin uh, picture there. So uh, I'm Skydog. I run Skydog Con. I run Outer Zone. Uh, I'm a volunteer goon at Def Con, Shmoo Con. I'm also uh, on staff at uh, Carolina Con, uh, Derby Con. Yeah, you're, you're, I show up to yours, right? And apparently, I have got a real purdy mouth, dude. There you go. All right, so why are we giving this talk? Well, I get asked a lot, how do you do these videos so fast, or how do you put them out there? And uh, rather than having to write up a long thing to everybody, I decided to put together a video on how we're going to do that, which is actually Evan's putting together the video for us, because Evan's in charge of video at Skydog here. Um, so I can then show this to the community and say, this is how we've been doing AV. And Trevor and I have a lot of experience. He was always listening to some of the places he's done uh, work for, either as a goon or doing some recording stuff, and here's a huge list of the ones I've been either staff on somewhere or another, usually on the AV staff. So why we got into recording hacker cons? Uh, basically, I think uh, uh, when we got involved, one of the problems with uh, the video at conferences, uh, we couldn't afford a, a whole lot of equipment, so a lot of our stuff was recorded on DAT tape. Uh, the regular DV tape, which if you record 18 hours of video for a conference, then you have to digitize 18 hours of video and then render 18 hours of video. Uh, it became an unbelievably daunting task to do that. So um, we, we started doing that just to, to have a record of what was going on. I think why we got so involved and, and actually kind of optimized the system was we got tired of having to spend all the time making that happen. So uh, we love like, doing the best quality videos that we can to share with everyone. Iron Geek has the, un, um, the most unbelievable collection of conference videos on his YouTube channel uh, because he goes around and, and, and does all of these different conferences. Uh, I do SkydogCon and Outer Zone, and I'm personally responsible for those. Uh, you do DerbyCon, and you, you're running more video tracks in DerbyCon than all of my conferences put together, and you do it simultaneously. So. Yeah, and so, so we do our own cons. We can use our own equipment at other conferences as we, uh, as we see fit. And uh, I ended up going to a lot of conferences and reusing the DubbyCon stuff. Like last year, we used some of DubbyCon's equipment to record SkydogCon. And yeah. we did the same thing for B-Sides Las Vegas and numerous others. I'll be in B-Sides Delaware here shortly doing yeah. their recordings. Yeah. And we want to see faster turnaround. I think originally I got into it because I came in and uh, for InfoSec, I wanted to record something. I said, hey, can I show up and just record it? And I just used the single camera. And uh, then eventually Skydog, I kept pestering him about, what are the videos for? I think it was maybe Freaknik 8 oh, or something. Oh, yeah. no, it was some, it was some a while back. And it's like, where are they at? And like, finally you got tired, like, here, you rip them. I'm like, okay. And then I came down to Outer Zone, and yeah. you just kept handing me discs, and I just kept ripping them yeah. there at the time. So next we'll talk about the history of our rigs. And the first thing most of us had set up, I know I had set up, was just a single camera. Yeah. This sucks for slides and uh, the old mini DV tape he was talking about, that kind of thing. Those were a pain in the ass to have to rip off through. And, and a lot of times, if you had a single camera pointed at the guy on stage, a lot of people wanted to see the, the, what was actually on the presentation. And if you did a wide view and a DLP projector, the video would have the, a wave uh, because of the mirror system that runs in a DLP projector. The, the actual presentation would have a tendency to kind of wave back and forth, which was very disconcerting and sucked. 
And it just didn't look good filming off the screen, even if that was an option, though yeah. sometimes we have to do that still. <laughs> so the way we started to do things, and this is, um, let's see what I have here. The way we started to do things is, um, this is my new setup to a degree, and I think I, uh, oh yeah, this is the second way I set it up, I'm sorry. I forgot what slides I actually have here. The second way I set it up was doing filming of the screen kind of sucks, and you have to have someone pan the camera. What we ended up doing was I had a little S video switch, and you can control which way the signal goes. So even it shows the person's laptop, and I had a little S video converter, VGA to S video, and I could switch between the person or the computer. And I think yeah. you had something similar going with the VMates. Well, what I, uh, one of the problems about doing something like that is when you switch a video signal, if they're not synced, uh, actually the signal itself is not synced, you get bounce. So if you've ever changed the TV channel on an old TV, the video got yeah. and it settles out. What you're doing is you're literally changing from one video signal to another, but the syncs of the frames aren't the same, so you get this just totally distorted bang. I basically had the equivalent of an AB switch, but it was a push button switch from Radio Shack. So whenever you'd hit it, if the sync was off enough, uh, everything on the screen would jump and it would settle back out again. So it was, it was absolute garbage, but it was all we had. Then enter AVI synth. AVI synth is a little piece of software. You can write a script to put together the videos the way that you want. You can say, put this uh, image here, put this video here, put this video in this corner. And it's more convenient. You can do this kind of thing in like uh, or Sony Vegas and so forth, but having it scripted makes it a lot faster because you just have to change a few variables in the script and go on with it. Yeah. I think the, uh, what we had done before where we were swapping from, from screen to screen, uh, I spent some time uh, in my office at Vanderbilt trying to do the, the scene change, you know, from this camera to this camera, this feed to this camera, and the problem with that was uh, in Vegas, you actually have to, you know, drop uh, a section of video out to switch to the other camera. So I have a, an AVI uh, guy that works for Vanderbilt, and I'm saying, yeah, I need to do a chop edit, you know, slot, you know slide be between cameras. And he looked at me like, you're doing this in post? Oh, man, you're going to hate this. So yeah, the, the AVI sent, when he showed up with this, you can imagine it takes three or four weeks to get all the videos and everything taken care of for DEF CON. Uh, Chucklehead over here was, was stopping a video at the end of the talk and rendering that video during the next talk. So your, your talk was one hour away from being ready for the web, which was unheard of in any of our, our circles at all. And these are just some extra tools you can go ahead and use with AVI Synth. Yeah. I'm not going to cover much because I have better means now, and we'll get to that here shortly. Yeah. So here's the set we were using with AVI Synth. My rig was I had the VGA to S video converter, I had a capture laptop, then I had another camera that would be filming the person, and then I just put it together in post, usually by watching for when someone chants, there's a slide transition. I found a better way for that. And I'll tell you about shortly. He found these things called V-Mates, which were pretty nifty. Well, uh, I found this thing called a SanDisk V-Mate, and what it basically did was took composite video and cranked it down and put it onto an SD card. So uh, I think I was buying them for 25, 35 bucks off of eBay or wherever I could locate them, and uh, I, I bought four of them. So the idea was I, I take everything coming off the camera and everything coming off of the uh, presenter's laptop, con convert it both to composite and then both of those uh, uh, signals went to two individual VMates that we recorded with, and literally the difference in frame position was how fast you could push the record button on both of them. So uh, the way that Adrian's system actually uh, worked was you could say, this is the start frame for this video feed, and this is the start frame, and then mix these two together. Well, depending on how quickly you hit the buttons, that number would be you know, fairly high in, you know, in, in uh, uh, indifference there. And another thing that I also had with my system that was a major pain in the ass was you almost had to walk out with a clapper and do, you know, here, here's our sync signal. Uh, at one point, uh, uh, C-Blind, we had done some work with, uh, they had an Arduino that you could put a board on top of it that would do video overlay. So we had this little Arduino, dual Arduino set up where you could push a button and both Arduinos would do an overlay on the feed, and it would do three, two, one, and it'd throw an X up, and you could figure out where those were. Uh, fortunately, we got all of that stuff figured out and didn't have to use it anymore. But it, the, the net, uh, you know, necessity is a mother, or mother invention, that's the, yeah. Yeah, but if there's people who talk about, oh, in post, we'll put the slides in afterwards, 
By no. doing us no. no. I, the, the, people talk about doing that, and they never actually do that I've ever seen. No. And there's one comment that one year, we, are, we know what I'm talking about, but they, said, they filmed us the person, and we're like, oh, someone send us the slides, we'll put them in afterwards. No, that's not going to happen. Also, you don't get demos. If that's maybe, you can kind of maybe make that work if you're doing just PowerPoint, but not for demos. So there, um, no, everything that follows after this point is uh, everything that Adrian has put together over the years. He's going to talk about the quality of the AV and all the different things he's done. I'm theoretically supposed to be competing in the Duplicity Capture the Flag event, so I've got to run out of here, and he's going to show you some of the coolest shit and the work that he's done for it. So before we jump into that, uh, uh, I just want to say a couple of things before I get out of your hair and you knock this stuff out. So um, a lot of people think that uh, hacker conferences are in a competition if they're in a general time frame from each other. And the funny part is, what most people don't understand is we all talk to each other. I work his conference, he works my conference, we go together and we work CarolinaCon. We only do that because you know, we're just trying to give somebody you know, something interesting to come see, some good quality content. So all of the uh, conference organizers, organizers, save for maybe one or two conferences, we all work and collaborate together. If I find something that works better, Adrian says, huh, well, I'm going to take that. And I'm not offended by that because if I find the better solution and he goes with it, great, but now you're responsible for finding the next step after that and I want to copy you. So we've, uh, uh, over the years, this has not been like a two-year process. This has been like, what would you say, six? Oh, I think I started going, what, what outer zone did I first show up at? That was probably when I started, started really working on I'm these. older than you. I can't remember. Oh, hell, I don't know. It's probably, maybe, oh, let's say six years, fine. Do yeah. I've never been to Carolina Con. I need to go sometime, but I've yet to be to Carolina Con. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, you know, six years of us sitting around and trying to figure out the best way to do it. Um, uh, it, it, it really, it got to be a thing where, um, a lot of times when you do one of these conferences, you don't exactly have a million dollars to put a, an AV rig together, so you end up having to figure out how to do it on the cheap. Well, a SanDisk VMate was dirt cheap. Well, the quality also sucked too, but I could actually get you video very fast, and it was of acceptable quality where you could actually put it online and people would watch it. But um, it took us a while to go through a lot of gear. I think you've probably had more gear that you've purchased and tested and, and solutions you've found. Yeah, which, a fair amount of stuff. And some things worked and some things didn't. Yeah. But it's, it's been an interesting uh, journey, definitely. Uh, I know that uh, uh, Evan has put together a system for us, which uh, is, I think... Yeah, it, it's it, much higher end than what I've got going. Yeah, it's extremely cutting edge. It's unbelievable quality. And uh, if you got you see the AV guys running around, shake his hand, every clap for this man and his team. Evan, raise your hand and wave. This man has worked his ass off. He's put together an incredible setup. Uh, we've got Paul. Uh, where is, uh, is Tom running around here? Tom's over in the other room with Night Carnage running the video on the other side. Uh, they have, uh, they've had some issues with uh, cables dying on them. Uh, they had some immediate, someone immediately go grab a set so they could get back up and running. And they're working tirelessly to give you the best quality videos of the conference. If you miss the guy's talk next door, you'll be able to go online in the next couple of days and actually see that talk. So anyway, uh, uh, you're going to have to make Evan come up here and give the, uh, uh, his part of it in a bit. But thank you. Thanks. Appreciate it, guys. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, Scott. And all right, next up we're going to talk about video connectors. And this is, I didn't know I have a good place of where to put this. He was talking with the VMates earlier. One problem with the VMates is they use composite video, which is kind of a worst case scenario. S video even looks better than that. Generally, if you can get some kind of digital signal you can capture, that's better. But the equipment to capture it is also more expensive. So you can get something like, uh, well, HDMI or uh, DVI-N. That's good. There's also stuff for more professional rigs, something called SDI, which I don't have a picture of up there. But later on, if you gently look at the table after the talk, you can actually see what an SDI connector looks like. It looks like a little BNC type bayonet connector. Um, VGA is probably next up. Though, really, VGA and uh, comp uh, component video can look just about as good as HDMI. You can get some pretty good quality out of that. And ultimately, it's kind of what we're going with, because most people are still using VGA out of their laptops. So it's going from VGA to HDMI. And if you could do a direct VGA capture, which are all devices for doing that, you might be better off than doing the conversion. Though, my scalers seem to work most of the time pretty well. His scaler is doing a really pretty job. And I have, a, I have the name of your scaler here in a few slides. Next up, S-Video. It's better, and I think it's, um, 
it does, it keeps the color and like the, the intensity of the brightness in two different channels. So if I understand the difference between S video and composite, and you get a little bit better signal quality that way. And when we were doing stuff for Skydog uh, down at Outer Zone, you could actually compare the, what was coming over component and what was coming over uh, S video, and the S video looked a lot better. Uh, though that may have also been some, some limitation of the V made. Okay, note on audio. Audio is pretty important because if people can't hear what the speaker is saying, there's only so much they can get from just viewing it. Uh, so Martin does a lot of the stuff for, uh, or pretty much all the stuff for audio at DerbyCon. But I have a few recommendations for people who are setting up their own conference. One, make sure you have time to actually test it. Unfortunately, this last DerbyCon, we, didn't, we had like six tracks to get set up. We were running around like mad. They didn't get the rooms changed over as fast as we needed. And so we couldn't do it the night before, so we were running around the, that morning, shortly before talks were supposed to start. So it's hard to actually get all the bugs worked out if you don't have time to test. Also, small cons, you can work with um, ambient audio sometimes, just straight out of the camera's um, built-in microphone. But if you're choosing something like a well, Skydog Con or Derby Con, it's just, there's too much, you know, it's just too much background noise and so forth. And you can go in and clean that up, but that does a lot of work in post. Another recommendation, avoid long cable runs. The longer your cable runs, you have some signal degradation. You also have more of an issue with uh, maybe something else crossing over that line and put, inducing a little bit of noise into it. So try to keep short cable runs. Try not to keep one cable on top of another. Try, try this sometime. Take an audio cable, lay it over a fluorescent light, and listen to the sound. Um, ha try to have all your items, for sound at least, uh, plugged into the same wall outlet. Otherwise, you might get ground noise. Ground noise is essentially where you have, like, let's say it's a, the conductor on the outside. You're plugged into this wall. Someone else is plugged into this wall. But it's still a potential, potential difference between the two different grounds that each are on. And that's going to exhibit as like a 60 hertz sound wave if you listen to it. And it's really annoying. You can clean it up, but better just not to have it. Uh, have all sorts of converters on hand, because you don't know what kind of audio you can get from the house. So I have like an XLR of 3.5 millimeter, though I think I've rarely ever used it. And um, Audacity can work wonders on some of this stuff. That's actually a talk by Paul Asadorian on like sound engineering for his podcast that he did at uh, B-Sides Rhode Island. I'd highly recommend ch checking that out. So how did we start making these things? This is that AVI synths uh, based uh, thing that we did a while back. And I'll talk about how that's put together. The way AVI synth works, all I needed was a laptop. I'd be capturing whatever the person was presenting. I was using a fairly cheap capture dongle and using S-Video on it. Unfortunately, I tried to order more of the exact same dongle for this last DerbyCon, and it had a different chipset on it. One of the problems of ordering stuff from China, you never know exactly what's going to be it when you get it, even if it's the same product number. I also was using a VGA to S-Video converter and uh, a SanDisk VMate. And actually, the results from this still looked OK. And this is closer to a system you could put together for maybe Oh, 75 bucks or so. It's not too expensive. And the results aren't bad. If you go look at the first year of HackerCon, uh, I was using pretty much this rig for doing it. Also, for doing my captures, I was using Windows Media Encoder 64-bit edition. The reason why is every other piece of video software I found just crashed all the time when I was doing capture. So this worked out really well for me. Unfortunately, it looks like it's been replaced by something called Microsoft's uh, Expressions Encoder, which has more limitations. It just kind of sucks, and, but you can still find the old one out there, not on Microsoft's website, but various other places. And if you really want one, I think I have a copy of it. I can get you someplace. Uh, AVI DMUX is some handy stuff to use. I use this for MP4 uh, processing, and I use something called Virtual Dub for AVI processing. And I'll be talking about those a little bit more later. Now, my newest stuff for DubbyCon, I was using AVI DMUX a lot because it allowed me to replace the audio in my talks without having to re-render the entire video, because that takes a long time. You can process and compress audio really quick, especially on this monster, but uh, video takes a while. So if AVI DMUX, I can specify, well, I could go in, I could bring, um, well, let's bring me to another tool. I could bring my MP4s into Audacity, and then in Audacity, I could export out a cleaned version, because you can, in Audacity, it's often neat. You can select a piece of silent area, and you can hear that background noise. Then what you do is you apply that and say, this is my noise. Find it throughout the entire uh, audio stream. Remove it. Then I saved this out as a wave, and then brought it back into AVI DMUX and recompressed, recompressed it and put it out. And that's the reason why uh, DerbyCon 3 sounds a little weird in some spots, because I had to do that processing. Sometimes when you're doing noise removal, it causes some, um, I don't know, it makes the people sound, what would you say, watery? You're, you're actually removing frequencies that may be natural to human voice. Yeah. So when you do noise reduction, you're going in and taking out amplitudes to certain frequencies, and so if you're 
it's, the yeah, audio yeah audio. it makes them almost metallic sounding, but it's yeah. better a lot of times than the click and the hiss and the, oh, I should have done more of that for B-Sides Las Vegas because of the constant air conditioning. I mean, one thing Vegas knows is how to go, do good air conditioning, and that was loud. All right, by the way, I mentioned how before I used to do a thing where I'd ask, go forward a slide, go back a slide. Go forward a slide, go back a slide. This has a couple problems. One, you have to get your uh, video crew to remind the speaker to do it. Two, you'll find them doing it twice. They're like, do it once at the beginning. Oh, wait a second, we're not going to start for another 10 minutes? Okay, I'll do it now. This is your sync signal. Do it again. But which one are you supposed to look at for signal? So I ended up just making this clock. And what this clock did, I was usually rendering out 25 frames a second just because the math is easier in my head. And this would show me the number of 25ths of a second since midnight. And I could use that to cut the frames exactly. So I'd film the screen. I'd record the rig, and I'd have my own VGA switcher so I could have my signal going. Then I'd know exactly how many frames to cut from one video or the other. And I could keep them all in sync. This thing at the bottom, I'm using my, to my newer rigs. That's actually in a milliseconds. And the reason I use it is it just makes, well, it makes me sure I know everything's in sync. Because unfortunately, my rig is not as high end as Evan's here. So my stuff is a little bit delayed, and I'll get into that in a bit. But uh, the clock is much easier to use than a uh, telling people to move forward one, move back one. Another useful tool, FFmpeg. You can do stuff to recombine audio. And uh, one of the problems with the first set of uh, videos I did uh, for DubyCon 3, I put them out there. And the muxing I did on them was fine for YouTube. It was fine with VLC. But archive.org wouldn't play them. And my understanding is probably other tools wouldn't play them, because somehow I didn't say, well, this is encoded quite like a normal MP4. So what I did was use FFmpeg, and I could quickly convert those to some that would work. And that's what I did here. You can either fix a file, or, oh, by the way, I should also mention, for um, DerbyCon, I was using MP4 format output from a tool I'm about to talk about, OBS, Open Broadcaster. The problem with MP4 is if it crashes in the middle, you kind of lose the video because it hasn't read the headers out. If you save it out as FLV, it still has the same quality because it's still using the same streams inside of it, but you still have the video if things crash. So you can piece it together. And that's what I started doing with FFmpeg. This one's also changing the uh, audio encoding rate, and it made the files a lot smaller when I was doing out of zone. Oh, by the way, if I needed to fix uh, the video on every, and by the way, after I did this, archive.org seemed happy with the, uh, the DubyCon 3 videos. And if I wanted to loop through a whole set of, uh, a whole set of uh, videos in a folder, I could just use these commands down at the bottom. And we would just loop through and do it for every single MP4 or FLV file that's in there. And I put them up there because you know four commands in, uh, win in Windows on the command line are a little arcane. Oh, should I also mention Christopher Hawkins came to me at DerbyCon 3 and mentioned, oh, I got another way you can possibly do that video and put it together, FFmpeg. But um, FFmpeg, I like the idea, and it might be good for eventually making a little set-top box with maybe uh, some cheap ARM-based stuff that would do it on the fly for you. But that is also pretty arcane, and I, I, ha I had to... <laughs> I'd had to hit control C to stop the video from going. And it didn't seem, I didn't do a whole lot of testing, but it didn't seem that much faster than AVI synth. So, um, and I found better ways to do it. But Christopher's on to something here. I think if he can put this in a little arm box and have it do it automatically with streams that are coming in, that would probably be awfully handy. But I want to miss, I mentioned Christopher's work. Oh, codecs and filters. All sorts of things I use. Uh, FF show I usually have on a box so I can play whatever video I get sent. Uh, Windows. Uh, 264, X264 uh, codec, Xvideo, and a few other different things, which I don't really use anymore, but I'm not really install. I go back to using the AVI synth method. Oh, crap, what did I just do? Come on. OK. Where's my mouse? There we go. All right. But one thing I will mention, if you start having problems with video, don't install the massive codec packs. Yeah, they might solve everything. Sort of, but when you install every single codec, I've seen other ones interfere with each other. You end up getting weird green screens, all sorts of problems. So I don't recommend installing every codec out there. Now, this is my AVI synth script. Now, while it's somewhat arcane, it's really easy to edit. So let me show you how that works. Where do I have it? Let me shrink this down temporarily. And see if I can get this up on the other screen. Where do I have it? Sample video. OK. Here's what we have is this nice little script that you can go in and edit. And I have no idea if that's going to 
What are you doing? I can hardly see it. You know what? Hold on a second. I got a better idea. I don't need to see ahead. I can just duplicate. And that makes life a lot easier for us all. Uh, okay. Now I see what you see, more or less. All right, so here we have it. I can say what video files I want to put in. I can go in here and add a caption, like title speaker. And I go in here and I shave off the number of frames I need to get things correct using the trim command. And I usually always try to have the slides started first, so I'd always know to trim from the slides. It just made life a lot easier. So I could go in there, edit all that, and then load this into AVI Synth, and uh, I'm sorry, AVI Demo. No, AVI Synth, I think I got that. No, I Virtual Dub, sorry, I'm getting myself confused already. Um, it could load it into Virtual Dub and export it out. But when it comes together, it can piece together all these little individual images, like the sponsors, the slides, the corner, and the person speaking, and you end up getting a video out like this. Very short test video for Christopher. But it's, unfortunately, it's not quite real time to actually encode it this way, so it's not playing quite right. But when I export the video out of Virtual Dub, it would be. So that's one way of doing things. That's the virtual dub method, though I have come up with some better stuff since then. Come on. All right. And it switched back to doing that mode that I don't want. But we'll get back to that later. All right. So I could get them out really fast because of prep work. What I did was, ahead of time, I'd have all my photos created so I could tell my video jockeys, like Mr. Fozzie over there. and. Uh, I'd say, all right, copy these videos into these directories after the talk's done. I'd have all that already prepped up. I'd have all the web page skeletons out there, so I could just upload to YouTube, grab the video embedding, put it into my files, and I'd have it all prepped up ahead of time. For DerbyCon, I had a bunch of uh, titles and uh, file names already embedded in a text file so that people just copy those out and then embed them in the video using the software. So it's all about you know, pre-generating as much as you can and uh, also having the artwork ahead of time. Also, try to get reliable video staff uh, Fozzie over there has been very good as far as being reliable. A few of my people flake. A few of them are just, I don't know. I think some of them just volunteered for the hell of it and didn't really realize that what they would do. I, most of my video staff have largely been good at DerbyCon. I, I had one that completely flaked on me, and he, it was like, I called him up and say, uh, dude, uh, why aren't you here? He like, where? I'm like, remember how you volunteered for DerbyCon? Oh, oh, okay, I'll be there tomorrow. tomorrow. I'm like, or oh, actually, I think he may be there. All right, yeah, came the next day, but he didn't realized he was supposed to be there in the morning because he misread the schedule. Was my schedule that hard to read? No. It was he, an Excel spreadsheet. He misread the schedule, so he came out like five after I didn't like meet him anymore. And then the next day, he, he said, I'll be here, and he didn't show up at all. So that's the only guy from, I think, DerbyCon that I'm not going to be asking to do video again. But people will flake, prepare around that, make things easy for him, make handouts. And I've also put some online videos up about how I was using Open Broadcaster when I was doing that so people would know this is what I want you to do. Uh, the new system is much cooler. I'm using something called Open Broadcaster. It's an open source project, so it doesn't cost you anything. It's currently Windows only. They're working on making it, though, work multi-platform. So Linux and OS X should be not that far from um, being out there. And it also gives you the option to stream. So if I want to now, not only am I mixing it live and saving it to the hard drive, not doing all that script editing like I was before, but not only am I doing that, I could stream it to, let's like, say, Ustream or YouTube or something like that. Now, the one problem I'm having is a lot of my old laptops I still want to reuse. I didn't want to buy all new laptops. So the only option I really had was USB 2 devices for capture. But HDMI, there's so much, um, there's so much information there, it has to compress it to get it through a USB 2 cable. And that ends up taking time. So everything's slightly behind. So I actually had to go into uh, OBS and change a few things to make that work. I here's the basic rig that I was using. I was using a Canon camera, and I was using composite out of it Actually, this is my Canon camera. I'm going to show this thing later. I was using composite out of it into a normal capture device like I showed a few slides back. I was using the Elgato, which is always a few seconds behind, to capture the person's uh, laptop it, signal so I could see the slides and the demos. And then I was using a VGA switcher to switch between my clock and them. And my clock might also have like a Twitter feed or some other cool things to show people. And uh, this is the cable I was using right here, that uh, STC. 250N. If you go out looking for these, by the way, a lot of people sell ones, they say of this, and they're not. They don't, they think, well, it's the same component ends. The way they do the grounding on the cable and which particular conductor is different, but they sell it as that anyway. I was also using these little scalar boxes, which I think were causing me problems. 
Um, but they worked, they're cheap, and when I was going to the other conferences, everything worked much better. I'm thinking there was something at DerbyCon 3 uh, on the projectors that was screwing me up. There's something called an EDID signal that basically tells uh, a laptop or whatever you're hooking it to saying, hey, I can present in this mode, so send me this resolution, this refresh rate. The problem is, if it gets the wrong information on that, it can screw up other devices that are hooked up in parallel. So I'm thinking there's something weird about the projectors there that was screwing me up, because I haven't had the problem at any of the other conferences, but I was having constant video fail at DerbyCon because of them. And oh, also, get yourself some good tripods. These ones aren't too bad, and I, I know um, Skydog had some recommendations. Uh, fluid head tripods, is that what he was saying before? The certain ones, this one's more of a camera one, but having a decent tripod that you can move and position is a, uh, oh, it makes life a lot nicer. Now, I had all sorts of problems. One, I had problems with VGA and HDMI scaler failing to convert a lot of people's laptops, though now I'm thinking that might have been the projectors, which I already mentioned before. I also noticed that, um, I think that this might have been the projectors, saying, hey, send me a four by three image, but I'm going to ask you to mat it with black bars on the right and left. The problem is I was automatically assuming I was going to get a 4x3 image, not a 16 by 9 image, or I was going to get a 16 by 9 image with no bars, that just stretched. So what ended up happening is it would compress it down here, so I'd have black bars on the side of every video, and the aspect ratio would be all off when it was in my vids, which is why if everything looks like a rectangle that's longer vertically than horizontally in some of the Dubicon videos, that was what was happening there. I'll have to do some things to keep that from happening. The long cable runs and not lack of testing had some problems. We had a lot of audio and ground noise. I went to Audacity and cleaned that up, but yeah, some problems there. And sometimes we had to um, film with just the camera if we couldn't get the slides to capture. And the problem with the way I was doing it with that composite is when you take a high def signal, you take it to the composite. Composite's the worst case scenario. Then I blow it back up to high def. Everybody looks grainy, it looks crappy. It, it wasn't a good scene. And um, another problem with, if I had done it my old way at AVI Synth, one, it would be cheap. I wouldn't have to buy as much stuff. It, would, it also would have allowed me to fix more problems, because you have the raw video still there. There's more stuff you can do. This is all rendered after the hard drive, and what, after it's rendered, it's not much more I can do with it. But it also would have took me a lot more time, because I think we posted like 138 videos or so. So yeah. So I tried to do some new stuff for HackerCon. I got this thing called an AVR, oh, sorry, AVA Media uh, Live Gamer Portable. And this thing does capture faster. But, and uh, the reason I was using another one of these instead of just two Elgato's, Elgato's software currently doesn't support having two of the devices hooked to the same machine. So you can't capture from two different feeds, which sucked. I also got a new scaler, though strange enough, this scaler, after I got it, while it works with more signals, it will not work with this Avermedia Live Gamer Portable. So that sucked. Uh, now I can ditch using the composite video out, and I can do HDMI out of the camera, and now it looks good. Go look at the HackerCon videos. They look a lot better than the DerbyCon videos because I had better equipment, but I didn't, have the, I didn't want to spend all that money up for five rigs at the time, well, actually six rigs at the time. HackerCon is only one track, so that made that pretty easy. If we get Skydog, Evan, you want to speak about some of the stuff you've been using? Sure. Get your butt up here and let me get a drink of water this time. And let me spill it on me, too. Um, yeah, the, uh, the rig that we're using this time, and we're doing some, some different stuff. So you, we're, we're using two laptops, but they, they serve different functions. Only one of the laptops is actually the video rig itself that's recording. Um, we wanted to build in a few different um, pieces for redundancy, and we also wanted to kind of have the ability to control what went up to the audience versus what went to the video recording. And so... Um, that way, if we did have an issue, we, we didn't have to go in line and unplug a projector or unplug the presenter's VGA split, you know, those types of things. So um, some of the stuff, like you see the Twitter feeds and all those things that are flipping around and the announcements that are scrolling through and things like that, um, it's actually a laptop that takes, um, that has a professional grade presenting software that's designed to intake multiple sources and feeds and do the flips and it layers uh, you know, stuff on top of other things, backgrounds, that's how we do the moving backgrounds and all the things that you've seen. Uh, it also controls, you know, the audio and other things that, that we can do. So it allows us to control the environment in the room separately from the video recording. Um, the other piece of that is it also, so the way that we take video and get it into the uh, laptop, it actually goes through that laptop to get to this screen. So like right now, um, Adrian's laptop is going through our uh, um, 
uh, video laptop or one of our laptops for presentation, it actually will take live video streams and will allow us to scale them and we can change it on the fly. And right now, Paul could take this and make that really tiny and put text under it or overlay stuff over it, however he wants to do it. So that gives you that flash or that flare. We, we just wanted to kind of push the envelope and, and try to do something cool this year. Um, so, but that being said, that's, you know, an entire piece of where you have a nice fancy computer that you ultimately don't have to have. What we ended up going with, uh, we, we did go with Mac and the main reason for that was hardware. I had nothing to do with um, operating systems or other things. Um, we were looking at uh, interfaces and ways that we could get HD quality. And so the entire con this year is, um, and, and right now uh, we have all the video, like it's, it's all done, all the transitions, everything is done in a, what's kind of like a live video software. And we have the capability to stream it live as it's recording. Uh, the choice was made not to do that this year just because of crappy bandwidth here at the hotel and some other variables that we couldn't control. Um, but it's a capability that is there. So if it's something that you're looking to do at your con, you can. Um, the other piece of the software is we're using a piece of software called Boinx TV. Um, it's a Mac-based TV software. It's kind of made for live productions and stuff like that. Um, it's ultimately has been really, really stable for us. And, uh, and so... Um, there's something about staying in an ecosphere of Mac or Windows or whatever, just, just kind of try to choose stuff that's there. But uh, the components that we're using to record, obviously to get HD quality, uh, to not have the lag, because the, the, the challenge that you have, the reason you have a little lag with these interfaces has to do with bandwidth of the video quality into, um, into the device and the bandwidth that you run into on yeah. USB 2. Hence, he has the lag. It's not a limitation of the gear. It's a limitation of, well, I mean, it's just the technology. So we wanted to kind of see where we, how do we do 1080p, for example? Um, how do we do those different things? And so um, when you start to play in that prosumer to pro end range of stuff, um, the price really starts to go through the roof. Yeah. And so um, we, we were, again, faced with that dilemma of how do we push HD? How do we push that envelope? So everything will be, is recorded this year in 1080i. Um, we hoped to, we wanted to have 1080p. The limitation were things like, even though we have these cameras here that can record 1080p, they cannot output 1080p out of their HDMI. They scale down to 1080i. It's just a limitation of the gear. Yeah, for another extra thousand dollars per camera, we could have it. Sorry guys, I, you know, if, if you want to contribute to the cause, my Amex is maxed out. Um, so, uh, we, we did, we got all this gear in. We have a, uh, a series of uh, Blackmagic capture devices which use Thunderbolt. And those aren't too expensive. They're actually cheaper than the USB devices I have. Yep. Unfortunately, they are a pain in the ass to get to run. Yeah, well, they, they are very specific. So once you step up into pro-grade hardware, you have to standardize on pro-grade hardware. It is designed for broadcast quality. So it's designed, and the reason it performs so well is that it's designed to use a specific input. So the Blackmagic capture cards, well, these, like, the consumer-grade cards are designed to take, you know, there will be a little bit of a lag or something like that in them because it's going to detect, it's going to do an HDMI negotiation and see, oh, you want to broadcast at this and I want to broadcast at this, so here's what we're going to negotiate. Well, with the pro-end gear, it's, it doesn't negotiate. You set it on both ends, and if one end doesn't get what it's thinking the other end's sending, then it just fails. You get a black screen. Well, we'll have to try later on because I want to see about getting these devices to work in Windows because I did set it to the settings you said for the yeah. Mac, it worked on the Mac and it wasn't working on the Windows side. Yeah. So it's, it's one of those things. But the other thing that we stepped up to, like I said, some of the hardware and the reason we stuck with Mac was Thunderbolt. The, the technology, Thunderbolt is, you know, granted, it's not reached a, a scale of adoption in consumer markets. It was really designed for, for pro uh, audio video, that type of stuff. Because if you think about video in the scale of bandwidth, just like you would have a pipe, um, to do 4K video, uh, Thunderbolt is a 10 gig uh, duplex connection. It requires it. I mean, when you start getting up into like 4K video, then 4K audio on top of it, I mean, it's like hundreds of megs per second stream. I'm going to up my game for next year. Luckily, there's more and more devices coming out that are through Thunderbolt or USB 3, which should be able to handle it without the delays, and I'll be able to get this stuff to work, look better and fast. Like, I'm doing, my last few videos have all been like 720p, mm -hmm. which still looks pretty good on, depending on the slides. And someone asked me, let me know when you get your final rig together. Like, my rig is never going to be final. Yeah, the, the technology is coming out constantly. Um, we were doing this a few months ago when these HDMI capture uh, devices were out, 
And we actually had to send several of them back to Blackmagic. We had some DOAs. We had some issues where, like, you would upgrade firmware and the device would just die. Um, we also had an issue, as we found out today, we built in a good bit of redundancy. I'm trying to keep this short for you. Um, we had a good bit of redundancy. Uh, we, we came with some extra. The problem with Thunderbolt is the cables are about 40 bucks a piece. So we actually had the whole rig over there die this morning. The first two sessions, um, we had to go back to old school stuff to just put an SD card and a camera and record. This is why I bring, when I go to other conferences, Derby County only have like six rigs now because of counting issues. But um, I, whenever I go to a conference, I bring an extra rig mm -hmm. because... But then this is so, this, some of this stuff is so expensive, it's yeah. awfully hard to buy that redundant yeah. rig. Yeah, and so we, we had redundancy in the rig itself where we could reroute video through switchers and other things in case one of them died. But the issue was not how, how the technology was routed, and it wasn't the laptops, it wasn't software failures or anything else. We had a power blip this morning that actually knocked out all of the Thunderbolt cables that we were using. So even though I had a couple of extra cables, we needed three, and it wasn't enough to get it up and going. And so uh, we had to make a uh, Best Buy run. Um, you know, it, it's just one of those things that happens. So, uh, you know, these are some of those things you're going to try and build it in. It, something's going to happen. Um, it's just going to be part of it. Uh, you roll with the punches, and we didn't miss any of the video for those guys. I mean, the first one, we popped out a cell phone camera, and you better believe I'm going to do every damn thing I can to make it as high quality and close to possible as I can. Um, he's not going to get any less attention from me than these guys. But the big benefit to this, to Boinks TV and some of these other rigs, I'm going to finish this up real quick. Um, there is, it, it records in RAW, and the benefit of that is, is that it's, um, I can compress to anything that I want to, and rendering down is very easy to do, um, and, and very easy to do on the fly. I do not have to sync multiple video, separate video signals. I don't have to do any of that. Um, we've actually pre-programmed all of the transitions. It does like layouts and fly, swing bys and you know, text comes up out of the bottom and all these different types of things that you click record and all the elements are pre-staged so that when we hit record and then we hit stop and it dumps the file and then we render it when we're ready. And the reason we are not rendering, you can automatically render it, the software will do that. We're choosing not to for processing purposes. We need to have the rig ready to go right back up for the next speaker coming up in five minutes. So uh, we're rendering in the evenings. Um, but it gives you flexibility uh, when you record in kind of a raw format. Yesterday's total for one track was about 330 gigs of video um, with stereo audio. So, uh, and at the end, I have nothing to render. I'll have to chop the ends maybe a little bit, um, but that's it. Last piece, good on audio. I'm an audio nut. Um, like this is my personal microphone, for example. Um, yes. Uh, anyways, uh, don't cheap out on the audio. Just don't do it. Um, yes. We have yep. done that, and sometimes the wireless might be an issue. Some places, yep. but all the other people doing various things on the wireless, or on yeah. not the, not 802.11 wireless, but wireless in general. Spectrum people messing around with yeah. new hardware, so that might be an issue. Though so far, I haven't seen it happen, and we didn't at DubyCon. I'm not sure why, because someone else is doing most of the audio for DubyCon. Uh, again, you run into you know cost issues to get good uh, prosumer quality microphones and other things. Um, it's very important, and so not just for the wireless perspective, but Lavalier mics and headset mics are very prone to feedback. They're very high gain devices. And so when you're working in very tight and confined spaces to gain it up so that people can hear it in the back of the room, you very much expose yourself to feedback. And that's something that we were not willing to risk um, because I can take, you know, I can gain up audio in a recording post-production. I can't get feed, getting feedback out is a totally different issue. Yeah, we're, we're, yep. I, got, I got a slide on that, too. Yeah, I mean, there's so many things, so many elements that we could talk about. Um, if you have questions, I, the, the way that I got into this, I came from the audio background. My father uh, uh, is, a general, is a vice president of a chain of radio stations all throughout the southeast. So I, when, when Wynn was telling his, his stories, I actually have pictures of me on a, on, like, in a DJ booth, you know, before there were sliders on, on soundboards when they were, like, big pots, you know. Um, and, and, and I actually know how to cut two-inch tape and all those types of things. So 
um, was an audio nut, went out on tour my, uh, uh, after I graduated college and went out on tour with a band, uh, a very large band at the time. And so uh, we, Wynn and I shared a similar experience we were talking about last night. But audio, all that type of stuff, totally different thing. If you have questions, see me. Thank you, Adrian. Right. Thank you. All right, had also the problems with my, uh, the new rig too, though. The Elgato was slower to start, and one of the things people talk about the LGP is being so great is that, oh, yeah, it's much faster. <laughs> yeah, it's faster, but it's not as dependable. It's kind of like the, what is it, the tortoise and the hare parable? Because that Elgato was constantly like one and a half seconds behind. I could compensate for that. I just delay my other live feed by that much, and it synced up. And you can do that all in an open broadcaster. Um, so that was a bit of a problem with that. I've also looking into doing it a different way. I'm looking into using maybe like a cheaper webcam solution because the webcam I can go straight in um, to my system and I don't have to use an extra converter box to do, capture an HDMI signal. The problem is it's not really, well, the webcams they say are 1080p aren't really 1080p. The highly compressed 1080p doesn't look the same. You also don't have the many focus options, so you have to crop stuff. and. You know, you don't have, well, the focus is usually not as good as like a Canon camera, and it's also the zoom capabilities aren't really there. But uh, it's another option if you want to go cheap, and this, it doesn't look too bad depending on how far away you're going to be from the people. So I'm going to actually demo that. This is what, the way my new system was working for DerbyCon. I actually had a USB video capture device here for the uh, camera, all going into the slide capture deck, and I had an HDMI capture device hooked to a VGA to HDMI scaler, I was capturing that and had all that hooked to a VGA switch so I could switch between the presenter's laptop and my laptop view. You know how he was showing announcements earlier? I had something similar, I was just using a VGA switch to do it and I'd throw up that clock that I was showing you before. So let's actually do a quick OBS demo. And there we go, and let me see if I can find OBS on here. And I was having some problems with this particular version crashing. It's constantly in development and hopefully soon it's gonna be open source also. But I have this, I have everything laid out in different scenes. You can go in, set up streaming, do all sorts of things. I'm just going to hit, well actually I'm going to hit start streaming and save out a file to the desktop. And that is not good. Can't create output stream, why the hell not? All right, no device, um, one moment please. And see I have this scene here where I have the sponsors. I can transition down to something else. Let me get this in here. And I can set a delay, and unfortunately, this thing is saying no signal because it's been sitting down there for quite a while. Hopefully now, in a second, you notice how it's delayed. You can compensate for that and you know, modify the delay, but notice that it's not really, the quality is not quite as good as the actual 1080p end that you'd want, but it's still doable. And I can mix it, and for later rigs, when Dubicon 4, I'm going to have some more HDMI capture devices, and I'll be capturing from my Canon cameras again because it just looks better. But I like this because you can switch between the different scenes however you want to split things, and it's nice and convenient. But that's just a quick showing of this, and I can try to do edit source. Let me see if I can actually get this to work. I can go in here, and uh, it was crashing on me before when I was trying to show this. I think this particular version was just having some problems. I can go in here and uh, hopefully go into the properties of one of the devices and then change the delay. But unfortunately, at this exact time, this set of hardware is not happy. My camera seemed happy with it, but my webcam does not. My Canon cameras, that is, going into the HDMI capture devices. But uh, that's Open Broadcaster in a nutshell. You can just set up all sorts of things, import PNG for your artwork, lay out things however you want. I'm going to try to wrap this up fairly quickly. All right, hardware extras you probably want to have. Mini display, the VGA, and HDMI adapters. People always forget to bring this, especially Mac people. They forget to bring their adapters. I don't understand why. So have a bunch on hand. Uh, HDMI to VGA adapters also, that's just having extra ones. Some people, some work better than others depending on the device. Um, some people may only have HDMI out of their laptop. A point there, though. Yes. You yeah, it's, it, it is a okay. chipset thing. You can find them online and they will not work. VGA is an analog signal, it's the A. It is, it, HDMI is digital and it's the D. You gotta have something to change. Yeah, it's an active connection that you have to use. And I actually have the one here I linked to, and these slides will be up on, on my site whenever the uh, video is. Actually, already up before my Twitter feed, these slides are already out there. This one works really well, so that's one of the ones I've been using, and it is active. 
there's also USB active cables you might want to get for extending longer runs so you can place your camera someplace else and still get it there. And Monoprice sells some of them. They basically have a repeater in them to get, this, get your USB connections much longer than you might normally be able to. And cables, cables, cables of all sorts. Have tons of VGA cables. Fangs break. Well, Thunderbolt. I, I haven't had problems with Thunderbolt cables because I don't have a Thunderbolt system. But I have plenty of VGA cables go slightly bad. Uh, he had a bunch of Thunderbolt cables go bad. It's always good to have redundancy whenever you can. There's also rigs we want to get, and thanks to for that artwork. Scott's got a rig when he goes to uh, teach classes. So he can record everything to the device itself. It does a capture of a camera. It does a capture of the laptop on the one place. Unfortunately, it costs us $1,600 a pop. And I don't think what I saw of the demos, it's quite as flexible as either Evan's or my system. As far as distributing them is concerned, I like YouTube. People say, you know, well, thanks for all this bandwidth you're using up. YouTube's bandwidth is pretty much being used up mostly at this point. And I film up on YouTube. Make sure you get yourself in a director's account. I think it's just a setting you can flick on so you can do stuff longer than 10 minutes. And then I also upload to archive.org so that you can grab files from there. And they do a bunch of transcoding into other formats so you can watch even more things. Other ones I've used in the past, Blip TV and Vimeo. I stopped using, Blip TV was a pain in the ass because it would keep complaining about video saying, oh, I don't know how to render this. But if you upload it again, it would render it. Or it would time out, it was just crap. Vimeo actually paid for it and it took down one of my videos. It was actually Dave Marcus speaking because it was something that was on, you know, cyber stalking of, of a sort. And it's like, dude, this is a professional giving a talk at a professional conference talking about this and they wouldn't even fucking respond and I'm a paying customer. So, from the bottom of my heart, Vimeo, go fuck yourself. <laughs> um, tips to speakers on how not to drive the recording guys crazy. Try not to be moving around a whole lot. It's really kind of annoying if you have to follow someone all the time. Uh, Bring your own dongles so people have that. So, you know, so you know, hopefully the conference organizer has some dongles of their own, but, you know, bring your own dongles. Uh, I don't know why Mac people don't do that, though I accidentally did that one time myself. Um, try hooking it up, the laptop to the projector before you open the conference. If you get a new uh, laptop, some of them don't work as well as others for hooking up to projector. Try doing it yourself. Know how to switch into, you know, dual screen mode or everything duplicated however you want it to set up in the end. Try to rock the mic. A good guy to watch for this is Paul Asadorian. He knows how to hold a mic when he's trying to talk into it. Now, I was told this had pretty good audio pickup, so I've been standing distance from it. But so many people, they talk really loud, soft, and they're way off from the microphone, and they don't. And I've seen people also do the wandering and the walking next to a speaker. Like, they have a lapel mic on, walk up to the speaker like this, back and forth. There's a talk from DerbyCon. Great speaker, intelligent guy, great content, but sometimes it would deafen me because I had to turn it up to hear him some of the time. Then he'd all of a sudden walk in front of the speaker and like, ah! All right, repeat audience questions is another good one to say because most of the time the audience is not going to be speaking into a mic. Sometimes they might be depending on how the conference is set up. And uh, also, please, don't make a bunch of edits that the person doing the video has to do. Like people who show client info by accident on the desktop or say something they shouldn't have. You know, or, or, you know, please stop doing that. Like I had to do that for one particular G oh, what was it, GCS 8 like twice so far. And you know what? The second time I had to do it is because someone said, all right, don't screw up and say the company's name like you did last time. You mean... X, Y, Z, he just told you not to, you. Okay, I love you, man. All right, future plans. Me and Sky have been talking about making a rig that we can actually mail to people, and they can mail on to the next conference and so forth, so it's kind of like a traveling, uh, recording your own con set. So get with us later on about that. I'm also thinking about giving away some of my old equipment because I'm not going to be using it anymore, and it's still pretty good for a lot of conferences. Uh, also more useful sites that you can check out later on for uh, getting videos in the format you want. A little bit of a um, promo for DerbyCon. Please come next year, which should be 24th to the 28th of 2014. The, the, the first few days of that is just training. Here's a shout out to a bunch of other conferences I attend at. And uh, finally, are there any questions? Oh, actually, I want to do want to show you one other thing about that video. I'll go back to the questions. Remember I was um, recording, and it didn't actually save it to the desktop, did it? Let's try that one more time and see if it'll work. Actually, are there any questions? Open Broadcaster normally works far better than what you're seeing right now. Uh, actually, while I try to get this working real quick, are there any questions? What I meant to show you was I was going to go on the desktop and open up this FLV file and show you that the video is already rendered out just as you were seeing it on the screen. It's really nice and convenient, but something is not happening with my hardware today, which is, goes back to, yes, test everything ahead of time, which, strangely enough, I actually was doing in the back of the room. And and then and the, it screwed up right now. But Open Broadcast is an awesome piece of software. Check it out. And uh, it should only get better with time. They keep you know, fixing things up, and it's going to be multi-platform here soon. So if 
Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions, find me during the conference.